today is still the fifth. Okay, perfect. So uh, we have a function. We are given a function f of x, which is 1 divided by the absolute value of 2x minus 4. And they're asking us to decompose this function into inner, let's denoted by g of x, and outer function, let's denote it by f of x, such that this function is the function composition of these two, and if g is the inner, oops, then g has to be closer to x. This is the inner, and then this is the outer. So f come g. Okay. Some people need sugar and salt or pepper and salt, and I need white out. That's my salt and pepper. Okay, so um, can anyone give us a, there is more than one correct answer here. We can even decompose it in three functions, but we are only asked to find two functions. So, inner. Excellent. Outer. Do we have to thank Tim every day? <laughs> Unbelievable. Okay, moving forward, you're banned from answering. I don't want to thank Tim every three seconds. He's a sweet guy, by the way. Okay, very good. Uh, find and simplify the difference quotient. This is a big, big topic. I was kidding, you are not banned from answer. Okay, so let's discuss this uh, first um, as a very important topic. It's a um, Calquani space functions idea. So we will discuss it in detail and then uh, we're going to look at different functions, not just the quadratic function, um, and determine it. Okay. So. I'm sure you discussed this in pre-calculus, but it doesn't matter. I, I need it now, and I need it from scratch. Okay, so here's uh, a function, f of x. And I will pick two points on f of x. I will pick p, and I will pick point q. They are both points on the graph of f of x. I'm going to give um, you the x-coordinate of p and I'm going to give you the x-coordinate of q, where this little h is a little bit, whatever a little bit means for you, tiny, point 0.1, point 0.3, tiny, which really means that q and p are very close. But I have to explain what I'm doing. So imagine that we zoom in. But they are very close. Q is right here. So we zoomed in because I need to explain what I'm doing. OK, now I would like to get the y coordinate of P. I would like to get the y coordinate of Q. The y coordinate of P is? Thank you very much. And the y coordinate of Q is? Excellent. Now I will connect these two points with a line segment. And because it crosses the graph of, a, of this function in two points, this line is has nothing to do with trig. It's called the secant line. It crosses the graph of the function in two points. At this point, I'm going to ask you to uh, find the slope of the line PQ. And what would you say? Excellent. Minus f of x. Excellent. And then x 
Excellent. Great job. Any questions on this? Any questions on this? Obviously, these two go away. So the final form is f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. This has to be memorized. In pre-calc and college algebra, we do not ask our students to memorize this because nothing follows for them necessarily in that class. But the entire course is based on this. Okay, but first let's talk a little bit about what it means. So, assuming you don't know that these are very close, obviously uh, the slope of this line will give us the rate of change of the function between p and q. Right? y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Uh, if I drive, let's say, to New York, and uh, you ask me, what was your average rate of change, or whatever, average speed between um, Wilmington, Delaware, and uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, then I will measure the distance between these two, y2 minus y1, and I will measure the time that I needed to drive from Wilmington, Delaware to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and then I'll tell you the average rate of change. This is what it is, right? The slope of this line. Now, knowing that Q is very, 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 very close to P, not identical with P, but very, very close, what, is, what does this really mean then? It's not an average rate of change between two points, right? Wilmington and Philadelphia, but is very close to the rate of change at that particular point. Not exactly, but very close, right? So if you call me and they say, what are you doing? And I say, I'm driving. And you say, what is your instantaneous rate of change of distance with respect to time, which is speed? I will look at the odometer and say, right now I'm driving 62 miles an hour. That's pretty much what this is. It's close to the rate of change of the function at each and every point. Okay, So the difference quotient. So this is the slope of PQ, which is also the difference quotient. We are going to calculate it for several functions. So please remember the idea because I need it. We need it moving forward. <clears throat> Perfect. So in this case, we are given a quadratic function, which is f of x negative 2x squared plus 3x minus 1. I may have said this last time, or maybe not. But when you look at this function, what do you see? You see a pattern, right? And here's the pattern. This is the pattern. So in other words, whatever, whatever, whatever. So if I want 2, I will put 2 everywhere. If I want 5, I will put 5 everywhere. If I want to put uh, x plus 2, I will put x plus 2 everywhere. And so on and so forth. Because I have to follow the pattern. The pattern says negative 2 times blah squared plus 3 times blah minus 1. We are asked to determine and calculate and evaluate and simplify the difference quotient, which we know is f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. So I see three pieces. I see piece one, second piece, and the third piece. These are the components of the difference quotient. Now the question is, which of these three components, or maybe all of them, I have outright and I don't have to perform any operations on them. Say it again. Okay. Of course, there is nothing I can do to f of x. So this is done. What else? And of course, there is nothing I can do to a tiny letter. What can I do to it? Nothing. So obviously, this is the only one I don't have. It is wise to calculate on the side first. So let's find f of x plus h. Excellent. Well done.
knowing the pattern, please tell me what to write. Excellent. I don't think you need me. I mean, you can teach yourself in this class. Maybe I could go home. I'm tired. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Well, I hope I can teach you something this semester. Perfect. Excellent. Well done. Good. In order of operations, in order of operations, what will I do first? Yes, I have to square the binomial. Very good. And how many terms do I get? Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I wanted to show one and five, <laughs> but you, you're too fast. Okay, good. So please give me those three terms. We have an agreement. What are those three terms, please? X squared. Excellent. Very good. Plus 3x plus 3h minus 1. Of course, I have to distribute a negative 2. And then I put all these three pieces together. Yes, perfect. So now I can um, write and finally simplify the difference quotient. Before we even attempt, there are two things that have to happen here, and this is extremely important to remember. For any function, every time we calculate and simplify the difference quotient, two things have to happen. In this particular sequence, not reverse, this particular sequence, number one, all terms in the numerator that do not have h must go away. It's a bonus if some that have h go away. That's fine too. I don't care. But all terms without h from the top must go away. Unless we have an error. And then we have to go back from work on it. Uh, the second thing that has to happen, the h in the denominator must simplify. Should the final answer still have h in it? Yes, of course. But not that one from the denominator. You'll see in a minute what happens. Extremely important to understand. Every time you calculate the difference quotient for any function, two things happen. One, all terms without h from the top must cancel out. Number two, h from the denominator of the difference quotient must go away. Simplify somehow. OK, so I have three pieces. Now this gets all this. And you will know I always run out of room. Moving forward, I warn you now, as you see, I already ran out of room. So now I reach the negative sign. And the negative sign requires that to distribute negative 1 to all three terms, in this case, three terms in the function. So positive, negative, positive. So positive 2x squared minus 3x and plus 1 over h. Any questions? The reason why I write here minus, it's not minus minus, change into plus. It's minus telling you that there is something else that follows. And I jumped here because I didn't have room, of course. Okay, what has to happen? First step, all terms without h must go away. Okay, negative 3x with positive 3x, negative 1 with positive 1, um, positive 2x squared with negative 2x squared. How many terms? So the first step, the first condition that was fulfilled, all terms without h are gone. Now, how many terms are left in the problem? Three terms. They all have what in common? Because the second thing has to happen now. Yes, and I have to pull it out. And that's how the second step, oops, this is, I said second and I wrote two. So that's how the second 
the second um, uh, must happens, right? Uh, adding the denominator simplifies with an h from the numerator. Now, please tell me what is left in parentheses. Excellent. And this is? Ultimately, this expression, not at this point, but very soon, this expression will give us the instantaneous rate of change of the function at any point. Not today, though. Because we need an extra operator in there. So that's what the difference quotient means. And since we're here, I would like us to choose a rational function so we can put that away and determine the difference quotient. Please give me any rational function you can think of. Uh, stay with the uh, linear polynomial over linear polynomial because otherwise it will take us forever. Yes? 2x minus 5, awesome. Say it again. 6x plus, Six plus 7. Awesome. We want to determine the difference quotient. And by definition, this is f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. I have three pieces that make up the difference quotient. Two of them I can touch, but the first one has to be calculated. For this particular situation, I really don't need to do anything on the side because I have 2x plus 2h minus 5 over 6x plus 6h plus 7 minus 2x minus 5 over 6x plus 7 divided by h. So that doesn't require, there's nothing I can do, right? nothing I can simplify in that rational function. I can only plug in or replace x by x plus h. Okay, now at this point, I have to remember how to work with complex rational fractions, complex rational expressions. Um, how do we subtract these two fractions? One denominator is 6x plus 6h plus 7, and the other one is 6x plus 7. How do I find the least common denominator so I can subtract them? What would be the least common denominator? Don't write anything. So if I have 1 half minus 1 third, they have nothing in common. They are prime numbers, completely factored. Do I say the least common denominator is 3 because it's bigger? Then I run into a problem, right? 3 times 1 is 3. That's OK. It's a 1. But 2 times 1 is 3, I have no answer. So if two denominators have no common factors, the least common denominator must be the product of the two. Then I say 2 times 1 is 6. The answer is I have to do the same thing to the top. Then I say 3 times 1 is 6, and I have to do the same thing to the top. And that's how I get the 3 minus 2. And that's how I get the 1 sixth. Is this clear? OK, so now we come back. I know that this, this does not look like that, but it, it is. It's the same thing. OK, so then let's try the least common denominator one more time. My markers are drying up. <laughs> Last night, the other class said, yeah, because you have a cheap I, I think I, no, it was Monday, um, uh, Tuesday night, they said that. <laughs> Tuesday or last week, I don't remember now. And they said, yeah, you have cheapos. You multiply the first point by 6x plus 7 and second by 6x plus 6x. We're talking about the least common denominator first. Yeah, that's right. 
So what is the least? What should I write here? Very good point. Very good point. Very good point. Very good point. Thank you. Thank you. Never multiply factors in the denominator. Keep the denominator factored. We wanted it factored. Okay. The product of the two. They have nothing in common. 6x plus 7 times 6x plus 6h plus 7. Awesome. So then this was multiplied by... We'll have to do the same thing to the top. This was multiplied by, we have to do the same thing to the top. Now, one other remark before we start this. I don't like to write this. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't, if you want to. But I want to explain why I will not write it myself. But you are more than welcome to. This is what I'm doing, right? I'm multiplying this by this. Then I copy the negative sign. And I'm multiplying this by this. And then the denominator, and then h over 1, blah, blah, blah. The reason why I don't write this is because some students will do this. I guarantee you. Which is not allowed. Because you are simplifying a factor from the denominator with a piece of a term in the numerator, and that's not allowed. But if you s combine like terms by foiling here or distributing and do not touch the denominators in any way, the factors in the denominator, then it's fine. But I will personally do not write this in order to avoid that risk. But it's up to you. If you know what you're doing, it's fine. What I'm going to do next, though, is this. I'm going to distribute 6x to these three terms. I'm going to distribute 7 to these three terms. And, of course, I'm going to run out of room. So 12x squared plus 12xh minus 30x plus 14x plus 14h and minus 35. All this is this product. Now we have to be very careful because there is a negative sign in front. So I have to distribute 2x to these 3 but change the sign at the same time. And then I'm going to distribute positive 5 to these 3. Ready? So I distribute negative 2x. Negative 12x squared, negative 12h, negative 14x. Uh, xh here, sorry. So 2x, 12x squared minus 12xh and minus 14x. And now plus... Uh, 30x plus 30h and plus 35. This time I ran out of room twice. What has to happen? Excellent. Terms without h must go away. And after that, the second step has to go away. Good. You cannot erase them and don't fudge it because I'm not going to give credit. Okay, so the 12x squared with a negative 12x squared. Look, we got a bonus. Positive 12x age with negative 12x age. That's a bonus. We didn't expect that, but it happened. Um, 
positive, positive 14x with a negative 14x, negative 30x with a positive 30x, and uh, positive 35 with negative 35. How many terms are left in the problem at the top? Yes, but they are combinable. I know that's not a word, I just made it up. We can combine the 14 age uh, plus 30 age and we get 44 age. So careful now, we write the equal symbol. We put 44 at the top and 6x plus 7, 6x plus 6 age plus 7. Notice that I have the equal symbol and the fraction line right in the middle of the equal symbol. And now I multiply by 1 over h. I change the division already because I don't want to write those too many times. Those fractions too many times. So, um, so this is 44 age, of course. So the top is 44 age. The denominator, what I had before, the denominator does not go away. Please do not waste your time to multiply these two. We want them factored, please. So here's the second thing that has to happen. And the final simplified form of this is 44, 6x plus 7, 6x plus 6 age, and plus 7. And this eventually will give the rate of change, not today, not right now, and not the way it looks, but eventually will give us the rate of change of this function at any point where the function is differentiable. We don't know that yet. Very good. Questions? Okay, moving on to this. It's an extremely important uh, problem because um, being able to uh, simplify by factoring is a huge topic. Okay, ready? Any questions on the previous problem? Three, four. Okay, here it is, x minus 1 to the third, 6 as a factor right there in the middle. They're trying to trick us. Uh, x minus 1 squared, x plus 2 to the fourth, and everything divided by x minus 1 to the fourth. How many terms we see in the numerator? Two terms, very good. So here's the first term, and here's the second term. Perfect. They have a common factor, or maybe common factors. So first of all, I should rearrange and just move the 6 in front. There are factors in a chain of factors. I can dictate the order. It doesn't matter. So I can write 6, x minus 1 to the third, x plus 2 cubed minus 3, x minus 1 squared, x plus 2 to the fourth. This is the correct order. factors in front, factors like 6. Okay, so now we can see clearly that there are three common factors. And then we can talk about exponents. Now let me just say this. Doing this will be a terrible mistake. Or maybe something from here with something from here, because these are terms. You cannot simplify terms or pieces of terms with factors. Okay, Good, so I see a common factor of 3 in both terms. I see a common factor of my x minus 1, don't talk about exponents just yet, one more second. And I also see another factor of now we'll see what is left. But first we have to discuss the exponents. 6 and 3 have 3 in common. No question there. But let's discuss power 3 and power 2. What is common? 2, because you have 2 oranges and I have 3. We only have 2 in common. We don't have 3 in common, right? The smallest of the 2. So it has to be 2. 
What about the power of x plus 2? That's it. Now let's see what is left. From 6, I pulled out a 3. What is left? 2. From x minus 1 cubed, I took out, took out 2 of those. What is left? In parentheses, very good. From x plus 2 cubed, I took all of them out. I reached the stage with minus. 3 is out. From x minus 2 squared, I took all of them out. But from x plus 2 to the fourth, I only took out 3 of those. So what is left? Yes, you have to put in parentheses, or you remember that you have to distribute a negative sign. It's up to you. So now, At this point, I can do this. Removing two factors of x minus 1 from the top and two factors of x minus 1 from the denominator. I am allowed to do this now. So then 3 stays. x plus 2, of course, to the third. And now in parentheses, I have to have 2x minus 2 minus x minus 2. Of course, divided by x minus 1 squared. So um, I have 3, x plus 2 cubed. I have x minus 4, and I have x minus 1 squared. Extremely important for chapter 4, in which we are going to look at um, derivatives and find a lot of information about the function. And we have to be able to simplify by factoring so we can solve the equation blah, 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 equals zero. Any questions? Any questions? Is this OK? Is this OK, everyone? Any questions? OK, perfect. So we have p of x now which is negative x cubed minus 9x squared. The first question is, find the y-intercept. How do I find the y-intercept for any function? I determine, yes, p of 0, which is 0. Then we're asked to uh, describe the end behavior of the function. Okay, uh, can anyone give us a degree of this polynomial? Any polynomial degree, odd degree, any polynomial odd degree will behave exactly how a linear function would behave. Any odd degree will behave like the linear function. I'll explain in a minute. Any even degree will behave like x squared. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Because I like to show you with my hands. So, odd degree can only do this or this. There's nothing else. So if it has a positive slope, we'll do this. From what? To? If it has a negative slope, to negative infinity. Agreed? Now, if it's an even degree, right. So, leading positive leading coefficient, x squared, always compare to x squared. If a negative leading coefficient, we always compare to negative x squared. So, degree three leading coefficient. I'm still told. Leading coefficient is negative. negative. So. Odd degree negative leading coefficient. So the end behavior would be so for this function, p of x from negative infinity to infinity will be positive infinity to negative infinity. That's the end behavior. 
this. This and this are the end behavior. So it will look, since it has degree 3, it will look like this. So end behavior. Next question, this, determine the zeros of P and their multiplicities. I know you know this from pre-calc, but I would like to explain it again. How do I determine the zeros or x-intercepts for a function? Yes, set the function equal to zero. Our function is x cubed, negative x cubed minus 9x squared equals zero. How many solutions <clears throat> would I have to come up with? Exactly the degree. If the degree is 3, which you told me already, let me write it again. Degree is 3, 3 solutions. I'm solving an equation that has a negative leading coefficient, and I personally refuse to do that. So I will multiply both sides by negative 1. Do you have to do that? No. But you will make your life more complicated if you don't get rid of the negative leading coefficient. Now what's next? I will have to... Yes. So I always tell all my students in all my classes two <coughs> key words that you should always have in the back of your mind. Factor and simplify. Always. What did I do here? I simplified. I don't want a negative exponent, a negative leading coefficient. What did I do here? What will I do here? I'll factor. So everything really is based on factoring and simplifying as much as you can. So of course I'm going to factor out x squared and I get x plus 9. And I have to come up with three solutions. It's mandatory. Degree 3, three solutions. They may be the same, they may be imaginary, I don't care. I have to have three solutions. <clears throat> so then what do I do? Perfect. So what do I get? What are the solutions here? <clears throat> How many times? Good. And x equals? That's it. So we have <clears throat> a multiplicity. What is the multiplicity of this solution? 2. What is the multiplicity of this solution? Is 2 plus 1 the degree? Perfect. OK, what's this with multiplicities? What does this mean? Let's talk about it for a minute. I am going to graph a few functions. And be, of course, uh, all I'm graphing right now is just what happens on the x-axis, right? We're talking about zeros or x-intercepts. OK, so I'm going to graph a few. The ones that cross the x-axis, as you see, this one doesn't cross. It's, it's tangent, right? It has one point. These ones that cross the x-axis are odd multiplicities. The ones that do not cross the x-axis are even multiplicities. The higher the multiplicity, the flatter the function is at that point. Does it mean that there are four solutions? Uh, x equals, I don't know, 5 here? No, no, no. no. There are not four solutions. 
but the function takes its time. Gets closer to the x-axis, closer and closer and closer, finally touching it and goes away from it very slowly, very slowly, very slowly, very slowly. That's all it means. So in this case, with a multiplicity 2, it will be this. At the origin, if we were to graph this function, at the origin, the function will look like this, coming from above or coming from below. Not like this, because it doesn't have a 0 multiplicity 4. It only has multiplicity 2. That's why when you graph x cubed, you don't graph it like this. You graph it very slowly at the origin, very, very slowly, very slowly, and move away. So that's what multiplicities mean. Odd multiplicity will cross, but it depends how. Even multiplicity will only touch. It will be tangent. But again, it depends how. Any questions on this? OK, moving on. When it comes to uh, the degree, that's determined by the leading coefficient in this case. Yes. Minus. So yes. So the leading coefficient is negative 1, has nothing to do with the degree. The degree is given by the leading term. In this case, it says exponent. It's exponent, yes. Any questions? Now, it's the same function, and they're asking us to uh, show algebraically if it's an odd or even function. So let me refresh your memory on odd and even. And hopefully, we don't need to revisit this. But if we do, we do. So for the first graph, I'm going to cut it with a horizontal line. I'm going to say that this point has coordinate x. And I would like you to tell me what is the coordinate of this point. <laughs> We're going to go back to, the, to that function a lot. Say it again. Yes. Is that clear? OK, perfect. Um, without knowing this side, I would like you to give me the y coordinate of this point. What is this value? Excellent. Without knowing this side, I would like you to give me the y coordinate of this point. Very good. This point is f of negative x, or the height. Good. And now. I would like you to tell me the relationship between f of negative x and f of x. Say it again. They are equal. Very good. That is an even function. Has nothing to do with even numbers. The function is called even because it is symmetric with respect to the y-axis. WRT is how lazy people write with respect to the x-axis. So an even function is symmetric with respect to WRT, the x-axis. So far, so good? OK, now here's what I'm going to do with this graph. Oh, I'm sorry, of course. I'm sorry. I meant y axis. I, I did say the x axis, didn't I? I'm sorry. Of course. Of course. It's with respect to the y axis. See, I couldn't have done that with the board. Of course. Daydreaming, sorry. Thank you. My apologies. Thank you. OK, so here's what I'm doing. I was in my own world uh, graphing this. I didn't pay attention to it. Sorry. OK. So this is a point. 
this is the origin, and this is another point. Of course, this line is y equals x. So I cut this graph with the line y equals x, and I'm going to create this point with x the y value. Perfect. Without looking at that, I'm going to say that this is, or well you can, but you know what I mean, it's negative x. And I would like you, not looking at that, I would like you to tell me the y coordinate of, the, of this point. That's why I said don't look at that. I want f of negative x first. Excellent. Great. You're way ahead of me, which is good. So now I would like you for a, such a function, uh, give me the relationship between f of negative x and f of x. And of, of course, you know, you're not going to say equal because it's not possible. One is positive and one is negative. So f of negative x equals the opposite of f of x. The function is odd. It has nothing to do with odd numbers. And it's symmetric. Function symmetric with respect to the origin. So finally, we can answer our question. So this is our review of odd and even functions. Why do we want to know whether a function is odd or even? It's easier to graph, and we understand the pattern better, right? It tells us something if it's symmetric. Not all functions are symmetric, of course. But we will discuss this again when we graph functions without a graphing calculator. Um, so we have, again, our function is the same one from before, negative x cubed minus 9x squared. The reason I presented this is because I want you to understand that if we are given a function, we're not asked to graph it. We're asked to determine whether it's symmetric, meaning if it's odd or even. In both situations, we have to determine this. So this is what I am going to start with, f of negative x. Okay? So let's find f of negative x. Negative, we know how we know what the pattern is telling us. So the pattern says you have to plug in or we have to replace x by negative x. So what do I get? Negative x to the third. It's still negative x cubed. With minus in front, I get x cubed. Negative x times negative x times negative x is negative x cubed. With minus in front, I get positive. Is that okay? Agreed? And now negative x squared is x squared times negative 9 is negative x squared. So I have three questions now. Does this equal f of x? If you say yes, the function is even. Does this equal the opposite of f of x? If you say yes, the function is odd. Or none of the above. So we compare now f of negative x, which is this, to f of x. Are they identical? No. no. So the function is not even. Now, I have to compare this to the opposite of the function. So <clears throat> please multiply both sides by negative 1. When I multiply both sides here by negative 1, I get negative f of x. This times negative 1 is this times negative 1 is, and now I compare this to this. Are they identical? No. So the answer is this function is not symmetric. It's not neither even nor odd. Is there a function that is odd and even at the same time? The answer is yes, but it's a function that nobody cares about. It's y equals 0. Symmetric with respect to the y-axis and also symmetric with respect to the origin, right? Who cares? 
So if you show that the function is even, you don't have to try to see if it's odd. It's not going to be odd. If you determine or show that it's odd, you don't have to try to determine that it's even, because it's not going to be. Questions? OK, uh, 16. But relations, yes. Relations can be symmetric with respect to all of them. The x-axis, the y-axis, and the origin. OK? Or just two of the above. So then we have uh, x plus 5 over x minus 2 equals 5 over x plus 2 plus 28 over x squared minus 4. OK. What type of equation is this? Excellent. It's a rational equation. Rational equation. Um, I'm going to show you a method that I think it's easy to explain and easy to understand, but it may not be for everyone. I don't want you to reinvent the wheel, meaning if you know a method that works for you, stick with it. Just watch and see if you like this method. If you don't, then what I'd like to do is, wh what happens when I move a term from one side to the other? What is the only thing that happens? The sign changes. Excellent. So it's the same thing with this. It had positive in front. I move it to the other side. It becomes the sign in front will be negative. This one it has a positive in front. When I move it to the other side, it becomes negative. So then I have x plus 5 over x minus 2 minus 5 over x plus 2 minus 28 over x squared minus 4 equals. If I don't have something on the other side, I no longer have an equation. Every equation has the left-hand side equal symbol and the right-hand side. So if I move everything I had from the left to the, from the right to the left, then what is left on the right-hand side? Yeah. Zero. Thank you. The next step, I will factor everything. And I see that this is x plus 2, x minus 2, as we know from reviewing that last time. And um, I have to state restrictions. What does that mean? What restrictions? What am I talking about? Right, in other words, the domain of these functions. But more importantly, what x cannot be than the actual domain. So if I'm here, I know x cannot be perfect. And from here, x cannot be? Negative. Excellent. So now I know the LCD. I think on this one, I would not want to run out of room. Potentially. LCD, please. Very good. Adjustments, I call them. Excellent. Exactly. You don't have to write it. Good. So please multiply these two and tell me what to write. Multiply these two and tell me what to write. And keeping in mind that there is a minus here and then a minus here. Ready, when you are. Excellent. X squared plus 5x plus... Two x plus ten. Excellent. X squared plus five x plus two x plus ten. Excellent. Minus. Careful. Plus ten and minus. Uh, Twenty-eight. What is the next step? Combine. Like. Terms, x squared, the negative 5x with the positive 5x, positive 2x, and negative 28 plus 20 is negative 8. 
divided by x plus 2, x minus 2 equals 0. Without looking, I'm going to ask you to tell your fraction is 0. What has to happen? When is a fraction 0? Excellent. So therefore, x squared plus 2x minus 8 must be 0. A fraction is 0 only when the numerator is 0. Or you can cross multiply, of course, because now this is a proportion, which you will, give, will give you the exact same thing. Good. I know how to factor this into and I get two options. Not so fast, indeed. Why? Will be 0 and the fractions, some of them, 2 of them out of 3. So this is the only solution. That's the reason why we stayed restrictions from the very beginning. Questions, please. Okay, um, next one is sine of 11 pi over 6. We have to go back to the unit circle. Say it again. 11 pi over 6. Go ahead. Oh, you're talking about this? I thought you were looking at the previous problem. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. So, first of all, I'd like to know where the quadrant. Careful. Yes, because this is 30 degrees, and 11 times 30 degrees is 330 degrees. This is 360, so I have to go back 30, right? 360 to get the 330. So this is the angle, 11 pi over 6. Now we have to determine the reference angle. This piece, if you remember, the reference angle is the acute angle formed between the uh, terminal side and the x-axis. You cannot use this one. It's not acute. It has to be lower than 90 degrees. So this is the reference angle. Reference angle. What is the reference angle? How much? Yes, or pi over 6. So now in order to determine sine 11 pi over 6, I will say, what is the uh, sine of sine in the fourth quadrant? Yes, so it's negative sine pi over 6, which is negative 1 half. So remember we measure, let's take a look one more time. For a central angle in a unit circle, this is 1, this is angle alpha, this height, this piece, is sine alpha, and the adjacent, this piece, from here till the center, just this, is cosine alpha. So cosine is measured on the x-axis, and sine is the height of the point, if you want, is measured on the y-axis. So this piece is measured on the y-axis. This piece is measured on the x-axis. Maximum 1, minimum negative 1. Maximum 1, minimum negative 1. 
Any questions? Can we go over the yes. 30, 60, I think it's yes. Yes, of course. I am just uh, one second. I have to stop this because it, it passed one hour.